Looks like it. Excellent. Esther Villar, the manipulated man. We're on episode five. Sex as a reward. Uh, if you guys caught me, I was earlier on Twitch setting up the thumbnails for this one. Feel free to come and check it out. There we go. Welcome, everybody. You know the spiel. Like, subscribe, blah, blah, blah. Uh, if you like the content, do the engagement thing, and that'll make sure that we can get this out far and wide, get a lot of guys who want to make themselves better, learn from their mistakes, learn from other people's mistakes, and make themselves generally have a better quality of life. This is how we can get there. Um, so this chapter, pretty interesting. Let me get to... The sex is a reward thing anyway. So you're going to notice a lot of this stuff. Like I said, this is probably my favorite part of this book. Like when I first had read it, when I first uh, came across the red pill, I liked it because it built up it anger phase. It gave you some kind of structure to the anger phase. And that way you were better able to move past it, no longer get angry. But the beauty of it is once you go back and to read it again, after you're past that point, you know, like a year later, two years later, whatever, you start to see a lot of the guys that are still stuck in the anger phase, still talking about these talking points. And I, I I get a certain level of humor coming from it when I realize that MRAs, MGTOWs, Black Pillars, all of these guys who make their uh, modus operandi, the, you know, women are bad and we are angry and we're supposed to be and there's these huge grievances. They're essentially taking the lead from a woman that was born in the 1930s, writing from the 1970s. 50 years have not increased their mental capacity for understanding the sexual marketplace one iota. And like I said, it's the big reasons I have zero sympathy for guys in those uh, movements, I guess you could call it, is because like out of 50 years, if you can't pull something useful out of it, you're wasting everybody's time. I don't know why you just don't go into the garage, start the car and leave it running for half an hour, but whatever. I guess some people just like to complain until a girl ends up touching them. So she starts off with, and I'll quote here, if a captive dolphin has learned to do a trick well, its trainer throws it a fish because the dolphin wants to eat. It will do whatever is asked of it. Man, however, since he earns money, is quite capable of providing his own food. So it would be impossible to bribe him in that way. In fact, his he's above bribery altogether were it not for one basic male need which has to be satisfied. The need for physical contact with a woman's body. Now, this need is so strong and its fulfillment gives men such intense pleasure that one suspects that it may be the prime reason for his voluntary enslavement to women. His longing for subjugation may not even be may even be a facet of his sexual makeup. I did a tweet yesterday. If you're watching this later on, don't worry, I'll sum it up for you. It's a guy in what I think is a jujitsu class. And then the coach is sitting there talking to him saying, I'm not going to try to stop. I'm just going to try to stop you. I'm not going to try to beat you. And then he put the dude's family on the other side of him where the kids are like, daddy, we need you. We're, we're lonely or we're in trouble or whatever. And the wife is doing it and they're all suckering up to that. And because he has that innate need for protection and longingness of love of his family, he's sitting there fighting this uh, jujitsu instructor and everybody's watching it and crying. You're like, that's the most adorable thing ever. He's willing to fight a master jujitsu expert in order to get to his family. And I'm like, this manufactured outrage is tapping into that male need for subjugation. And it's, damned weird <laughs> i'm just checking out chat right now you guys are hilarious so understand there's a reason why a lot of the guys in this space have referred to it as a sexual marketplace because it is essentially a barter system you want to trade the things that the women find valuable for the things that men find valuable and for the most part there's only one thing a man finds valuable and that's what we call in shorthand sexual desire because it's not just sex if it was just sex it would be get a prostitute, life would be good. And for the most part, most guys don't want that. I have a feeling even in the places that are legal, they still have celibate men. So it's obviously not a case of cash. It's not a case of that. It's that genuine desire, which I would argue, and I think it's going to come up later in the episodes. If you notice, we're going to be doing four short episodes. We're trying to keep down to 15 minutes. So we're going to be doing a lot of switching from video to video, but it's still the same amount of content you'd already seen in a day, just a little bit easier to digest. So where am I going with all this? Well, life is transactional. And so you have to pick a currency you want to barter with and then suffer the consequences for that. What do I mean by this? Take the initial idea of provision. I'm a good father. I raise good kids. I have a good job. That's your that's what your value you're leading with. 
And this is where you end up getting into a lot of trouble because girls don't need that anymore. Father is a fungible, a fungible position. And if you don't believe me, how often is it that a girl gets married, has kids, divorces the man, finds a new husband within the year? So as much as we like to say the father is the most important job in the world, it's easily outsourceable, no different than tech support. Something to think about. So obviously that isn't the thing that's valuable and that has a lot of cost with it. It obviously is very expensive to maintain a good job, break your back under labor, and out of it, you've devalued what you're offering to such an extent that women don't value it themselves. So it's a very bad currency to barter with. What I talk about is branding yourself as a luxury product. And that's the thing. So if the masculine ideal has been de has been commoditized so much, it's basically valueless. Well, then what is valuable? We can look to economics for that. What's valuable in a society where everything is need, everything that we have, we need. Housing is taken care of, food's taken care of. We have an amazing abundance. Then people end up buying a fancy luxury projects. They buy things that are sexually selected for because of their expense. We'll buy a diamond ring that costs three months salary for just a little piece of coal because it shows we have so much money, we can throw it away on dumb stuff. And that sends higher value signals. So it's all about signaling. Even, and we kind of understand this, even in the suburbs where people are still tying into that whole, you know, I'm a good father, I raise good kids, I have a good job thing. Consider the concept of a lawn. People don't know this, but a lawn used to be a flex. A lawn was what the aristocrats would use to signal, I am so wealthy, I have enough land that I don't even need to put crops on this land. And that was their way of showing they have so much land they didn't know what to do with it. So again, this whole thing, idea of a lawn is a, is a devalued social signal that has happened from over time. And now it's at the point that a guy having a lawn does not impress anybody. It doesn't achieve anything. Now a guy can say, well, I like my lawn. I like taking care of my lawn, which is fine. But don't use that then to try and get yourself genuine desire from a girl because it's clearly not the case. We always say, do it for yourself. Yeah, well, do it for yourself and just stop trying to use it as a currency. Again, luxury stuff. If you're the top tier man, if you're the man that she could flex on her friends with, because remember, women may not love men, according to Esther Villar, but they love to hate women and they love that validation from their, their female communities. Now, obviously, women do love men and women can love men, maybe not in the way you like, but they can do it. But again, this whole tapping into the luxury brand thing, being the hot commodity does you far better as far as the transactions of a relationship goes than picking all these antiquated symbols or what Rolla would call old order thinking. Uh, she eventually goes into it later on here, and I'll quote where they talk about the difference between men and women when it comes to chastity. Again, this is written in the 70s. Of course, they're going to be talking about chastity as opposed to just being a virgin or a celibate man. But chastity on a man has never been worth much. As women do not really care for men, they are not much interested in his chastity. For this reason, a boy can never be raped by an older woman, only seduced. But let a man play that game with an adolescent girl, he'll be lynched as a sex criminal by a female mob. Which is true. Eggs are expensive, sperm is cheap. And if you boil it down to its essence, that's why when you see a case of a teacher diddling a 14-year-old kid, you're either going to get... That man is bad. We need to have him lynched. And God knows if you want to go to conservative Twitter, that's all they ever talk about is all the pedals that are hiding in the bushes everywhere. But you get a female doing it to a male student, sometimes even as young as 10, guys will generally have the approach of good for him. Or even if you understand it's wrong, most guys don't have that same visceral reaction. They'll have like a, well, by the law, that's law, that's law. So it should be wrong. They look at it like it's a traffic ticket. And it's something that's just hardwired into us. You just have to realize that the things we value in women are not the things we value in men. It creates a double standard. And if you start, like it's already bad enough if you're trying to use a devalued currency to barter for yourself, for your own well-being in the sexual marketplace. But using the things that girls value, it's like the, uh, it's the opposite of using, um, oh, and I always get this stupid name wrong, not attrition. But it's essentially a market thing. Understanding that, let's say the States makes awesome, awesome movies. That's their export. So for Americans, movies are like, whatever, no big deal. Meanwhile, you go to like some cheap third world country and an American movie is highly valued. So they export those things that they don't value there. These people value it higher. 
Meanwhile, that small third value, third world country can build cheap shirts, which is highly valued in the States, but not valued there. Nobody cares about Gucci because they don't care about branding. That would be, so the equivalent of a guy trying to bring this whole equating thing, like the MRAs and the MGTOWs that talk about, well, the, the teacher diddled the male student. Trying to put that on the same level as a male doing it to a female student is the equivalent of Americans saying, look, I can buy, I can make cheap Chinese knockoff clothing. Why don't you guys love me? And they're like, why would I care about this? <laughs> like China cares about bring it over. You're trying to sell them to the Chinese area and they're just not going to like it. I know it's a bit stumbly on the explanation here, but you kind of get it. I really wish I could remember that name. I'm having the biggest brain fart right now. It's not arbitration. It's not arbitration. It's uh, attrition. No. Arbitrage. That's what I'm talking about. Arbitrage. Ignore the last 30 second rant. Just realize we're talking about arbitrage. Um, so we get past the sperm is a uh, sperm is cheap. Eggs are expensive speech. And then she kind of goes into how for a large part of this, men might not be hardwired for it. It might be a, a training thing. It might be about bad parenting strategies or gaslighting as she puts it. But so in her example, a man could, of course, condition his sexual needs as easily as a woman, provided his training started at a very early age. Sufficient proofs of this are the monks, a majority of whom survive without sexual satisfaction, and nobody will seriously maintain that they're all eunuchs. But instead of learning to suppress his needs, a man will allow them to be encouraged whenever possible by women, of course, since their interests are mainly directed towards a man's libido. What she's kind of getting at here is a social training kind of program. And I know a lot of feminists have really gone on the wire about this, shaming men's sexual inadequacy. You'll notice this amongst the, I'm not like the, I'm not like the feminist anti-feminist types that still try to manipulate men, but they do it in this chastity way. Like you need to control your libido. Porn is cheating. And uh, Christian girls are bad for that too. It's essentially the kind of vilified things you see Christian girls do. But then you realize it's not that they're trying to remove the boots off the necks of men. They're just mad that it's not their boot. And let's face it, it's been until we hit the Industrial Revolution and the understanding of how to build an like an, uh, internal combustion engine, men controlling men's sexuality has been the primary productivity driver through the entire agricultural revolution. So it is a powerful thing. The male sex drive is what allows us to accomplish just about anything that robots can't do. So I would argue in this one, this is where she gets it completely wrong and that she wants men to control this and basically become neats. Like we've seen, it's it's the 70s, so they didn't have video games back then, so they didn't have neats. But we're seeing how it comes out now. Uh, a generation of men who just waste away. Herbivore men. And that's essentially what she made the argument for. And this is why I love when you read this stuff with a critical eye, because you see she's basically encouraging guys to check themselves out of the sexual marketplace in order to depower women. But when you do that, you end up losing a large part of what makes men, men, essentially our ability to get things done, our ability to change the world around us. And I would argue, I don't think Xbox and weed is a nice solution around to that. I think the better solution is just to, to understand your instincts, to understand your desires, and then to strategize around them. Because otherwise, if you end up having incongruent goals, the house in the suburbs, I have a giant lawn, so girls know I have more land than I know what to do with. Then they end up getting manipulated by a girl because they're very incongruent with the type of currency they want to use in the sexual marketplace. As opposed to a guy knows he's sexual, he knows he desires women, he ends up strategizing around his luxury branding as a man, being in shape, being stylish, being socially aware, being able to be a social flex on people. Offer the things that money alone cannot provide. Then you're able to not only be in touch with your needs here, with your instincts, but you're also better able to use them so you're not constantly being manipulated. Because I know the biggest fear of a lot of guys is to be that suburban dad who has to work himself to the bone in order to provide his family with the lifestyle they've become accustomed, using the kids and the wife's happiness as a crutch, as a cudgel. Same as that jujitsu video I was talking to you about before. In order to manipulate him to work himself to death for somebody that once he's gone... We'll just throw them away, try a new one. It's like I've always said with the plow horse. Plow horses love to plow so long as they get the best stable and a good retirement. But in reality, once the plow horse is done plow plowing, it's off to the glue factory. And you don't want that for yourself. 
Um, she ends this one off, though, on the idea of the differences in jealousy between men and women. So this one, uh, guys cheating, a girl may well feign jealousy occasionally just, of course, to flatter him. They don't mind the institution of brothels either. The attitude towards extramarital affairs is exactly the same unless, of course, they become too obvious, in which case they tend to forgive the men. So how few women would leave an unfaithful husband? How few men would stay with the women in those same circumstances? Put a pin in that. We're going to get back to it. Wives will often welcome a philandering husband, for there are so many advantages arising from his gratitude for her tolerance and forgiveness. Obviously, women would prefer to be able to control extramarital affairs. That explains the wife-swapping parties and pluralist sex practices that are gaining favor, for they tend to neutralize the sexual fantasies of husbands and male friends. Two points in here, and then we're going to end the video. The first one is about extramarital affairs. Girls don't like prostitution because that guys have to spend money towards prostitutes. Girls spending money towards that when it should be towards spending a new vacuum around the house or a new handbag or whatever it is they want of material goods. If you're at the point where a guy's so unable to cheat on you, the idea of holding his sex sexuality under lock and key is really the only leverage you have. The idea of pulling away the sex carrot is what gets that man back to work and gets him to work so hard and promises of just maybe a whiff. Now, this is not conscious. This is all subconscious. And that's why it's so important that you have to strategize around it. Because a girl's just running off of instinct. They don't know any of this stuff. Their motivations have nothing to do with this. And they will give you a long story about how I don't know what I'm talking about. But what I will say is this. The outcome comes out exactly like this. So does it really matter what's going on inside the girl's head? I would argue no. The outcome is exactly like this. If this is a way that you can understand it, that's great. If you want to understand it with a different set of models, that's fine too. As long as you understand the outcome and change your strategy in order to align with it, you're doing well. Again, in this case, just trusting this woman from the 70s talking about this stuff wholesale is how you end up in a MGTOW cult. And you don't want that. Uh, the second part is the philandering husband part. I know Rolo's talked about it. We'd rather share an alpha than be saddled with the beta. I'm sure you guys know that speech by now. The idea, and here's here's the funny thing. We've gotten to a point, and I don't know if we always have or if it's a recent thing, where the cheating itself isn't what gets the girl to leave a guy. It's the lying. Now, we're going to get to later on into that. Uh, it's on the next chapter, I believe. But men being honest and cheating is a far better result than a men being dishonest and cheating. Again, because it's those lies. It's, she knows she cannot trust his honesty, so she can't trust, are you making any more money? Are you going to be here for raising the kids? It's always that what's in it for her. If she truly either has, if she, <clears throat> excuse me, if she doesn't have that guy she sexually desires, but she's still getting provision from, the last thing she wants to hear is that he's lying to her because then that's a threat to her provision. And that's why those girls tend to leave. Uh get to your super chat in just a second here. I'll finish that thought. But from Red Pill perspective, again, Wine More Please has an article on this. I'm not going to link this. It's a bit little controversial, but if a girl's concerned about you cheating, what he says is like the, the 101 level answer is, don't worry. If I do, you'll be the first one to know. And then his 201 level answer is, are you sure you want to know? Again, there's a discretion involved. There's a high value implication and there's an honesty along with it, along with not rubbing a girl's nose in it or embarrassing her publicly. That makes it far more likely that a marriage or a relationship will survive with any cheating so long as everything else in place, as opposed to one where a guy is seeking validation from girls, but he's embarrassed about it. He's insecure about it. He does those nice guy behaviors of lying about it. And that's where these things tend to blow up. Like I said, at least if it's being honest, a girl can opt into her own situation. And if a guy is high enough value in her eyes, in that luxury brand style I talked about before, it tends to be a more, uh, it has more longevity as a sexual strategy, I'll say. It's not ideal. Monogamy, if you want to go the rat route, is fine. But just be aware when it comes to jealousy, there's a certain dynamic at play. And you really need to account for that in any kind of sexual strategy you do. Whether you want to be the trad guy with six kids or whether you want to buy the guy with an open relationship or with a mistress on the side, the French model. So on that note, I'll leave you there. Quick shout out, Matthew Magda. Thank you for the $10 super chat. Why do you do this? At what point in your life did it become a mission to spread TRP as a message? Um, That's a good question. So 
I was always kind of interested in it. And then I hit some hardship on my life. Then the guys there helped me out. I got to do my thing. I've been treating it like a take a penny, leave a penny jar. I got this much help out of it. I'll try to contribute more. Then I kind of also came to the uh, understanding that one of my more rewarding times when I was in the military was my time teaching at fleet school. So the idea of teaching as a rewarding experience, I found very valuable. Add to that um, the corporate experience, driving and traffic. I really didn't like that stuff, but it all kind of came together. And I'm like, you know what? Building this stuff is actually way more rewarding, way more fun, and it doesn't pay as well, but you know what? It pays the bills and that's good enough for me. So that's kind of the big reason I'm here. And then beyond that, the entertainment side, I've always been an artist at heart. So just being able to put up some nice entertaining videos on YouTube or on Twitch and get guys to have some entertainment from it ties into it as well. Like I love the idea of books like Punch Riot or uh, Opium Tales paintings, books, creative stuff that's kind of designed for a male audience. And so again, that's part of that too. So hit my creative itch. So I hope that answers your question. But anyways, thanks for tuning in, guys. We're going to move to episode two. We're going to talk about the female libido. It starts, well, it started five minutes ago, but you guys already know it's coming. Anyways, I'll catch you guys in a minute. If you're watching this after the fact, don't forget to like, subscribe, check out the full series in the cyber. The playlist is there. You'll enjoy yourself. Trust me. Now we got to do 20 seconds of this. So that way we can have room for the end cards. Nash, by the way, has a good point. Uh, my book, Fuck Files, has a lot of the answers. I love saying that. Like, yeah, so many things do reference the book, which is nice. Anyways, I'll catch you guys in a minute.